Hello, party people, and welcome to Godafoss in Iceland. Godafoss, Iceland's uh, waterfall of the gods. That's where the God of Godafoss name comes from. Um, Godafoss got its name from the uh, time when the Christians came over here and had the Icelanders learn about Christ and then uh, proceeded to tell the Vikings to throw all their old statues of gods over into this waterfall here. That's the legend, anyway. Uh, as to how it got its name, Godafoss. I am nicely comfortable, all bundled up here, over here for a couple of weeks, and so it's time to bust out the really big uh, winter wear. Let's go. This week, uh, it's a lot of philosophical questions here. In the, I was going through the questions leading up to getting ready to answer them, um, and I was surprised by how many of them are really philosophical in nature. Uh, so let's start with. My tea got cold says, if I have a standard edition box, let me make sure I get this right. If I have a standard edition box that runs nothing other than a single instance of SQL Server 2022, what is the absolute maximum amount of RAM that's worth putting in it? I know it's more than 128 gigs, but surely it's less than one terabyte. terabyte. Boy, if that's not a philosophical question, I don't know what is. Those of you who are fans of the webcast will know the question I am going to ask even before I answer it. What in the Sam hell is the problem that you are trying to solve? If you have a problem that needs more than 128 gigs of RAM, son, you don't need more RAM, you need Enterprise Edition. That's what SQL Server Enterprise Edition is for. Otherwise, if you're just playing around trying to allocate a whole bunch of memory to a server, go do something productive. Now, what I will say is, is in environments where somebody's given me a physical server to run Standard Edition, this has been years since this has happened. Uh, but I would just throw 192 gigs of RAM in because it was cheap and call it a day. But these days in the day and age of the cloud and colo servers, that's no longer a cheap question to answer. Next up, I Hate Toast says, Hi Brent, any advice on how to be taken seriously when voicing concerns outside of your job role? I do map support for a software vendor and I'm trying to learn database things. I just found out that our 500 plus customer servers have never run CheckDB and it scares me. Uh, this is true all throughout your career and has nothing to do with tech either. The simplest way to get taken seriously uh, when you have concerns outside of your job role is first go to the person, if there is one in your organization, whose job role it is and say, hey, I, I'm just happen to be learning something and I notice that this is happening and it scares me. Does it scare you? And if so, why, why not? Because sometimes they've got it under control, they just haven't told you about it. For example, maybe someone's restoring all of those databases onto another server, uh, and then they're running CheckDB there to offload it, which is a valid way of doing things. Um, other times, if there's no one in charge of that, and you would like to be in charge of it, uh, and you want to take on that responsibility, then first you go to your manager and you say what bothers you out loud. You say, hey, in this case, for example, hey, I noticed that none of our servers have been running CheckDB. Here's why that scares me. We could permanently lose data, or we may have already lost data. Here's what that would mean for the business. How do you feel about that? And depending on the outcome that you get from your manager, what you follow up with is say, okay, great. Based on this conversation we just had, like for example, maybe it doesn't bother your manager at all. You say, based on this conversation we just had, I'm just gonna put this down in writing. I'd be a bad employee if I didn't. I'm gonna summarize our, our conversation and I'm just gonna forward it to you via email. And so that way, your manager has a reminder of what your concerns were and can bring it up later or can forward it to their own manager. Sometimes they'll forward it to their manager and say, this is what I'm reprioritizing. I hate toast. I'm reprioritizing their work so they can start working on this thing. Um, and putting it in writing just helps it to be easier for your boss to forward those concerns on without having to rehash your case. Other times your boss will say, yeah, you're right. That scares me too. And that'll be the end of the conversation. And putting it in writing just helps you cover so that uh, if, in fact, you do run into problems later, you can say, yeah, see, I was worried about this too, and just we decided not to do anything about it. And that way your rear end is covered. 
That's about all I'll say there. Uh, okay, next one. This one's going to be a little tricky. Let me make sure I get it fired up here so I can put it right into poll, Gab. So help me says, the problem I'm trying to solve is to eliminate the problems created by index maintenance where not doing this is not popular in my shop. I'm going to say that again because it's really complicated. The problem I am trying to solve is eliminating the problems created by index maintenance where not doing this is not popular in my shop. There's more. I'm not going to read the rest. We're going to stop there. I had to read that question three times to make sure I understood what was going on. And in order to make sure I got it right, I even pasted it into chat GPT, which is really good at doing this. When sometimes somebody sends you something, you're not sure what it means. Put it into chat GPT and say, can you please rephrase this in a way that is concise and easy to understand? What ChatGPT told me is, is your shop insists on doing index maintenance and you're trying to minimize the amount of problems that that causes. And that's completely fair. But I think the reason that your, your team is insisting on doing index maintenance, even when it's causing you problems, is that you're not doing a great job of communicating the problems that you're having and I say that you're not doing a great job of communicating because let's face it, we just heard that same sentence together, right? And it sounds kind of convoluted. So what I would suggest that you do is go open up ChatGPT. It's phenomenal at this exact kind of thing. Open up ChatGPT and take whatever it was that you wanted to send to your manager, whatever it was that, or the people who are insisting on doing index maintenance and tell them about the problems that you're having. But tell it to ChatGPT and tell it, hey, I want you to re or, uh, summarize this for me or rephrase it in a way that's concise, that's important, and is easy for non-technical people to understand. You're going to do that and you're going to get dramatically different results. And if you repeat that a lot throughout your career, you're going to start to learn to communicate better. You're going to start to learn to see how to phrase things in a way that will be more likely to get the result that you want. Now, as to the second half of your question, I'll be honest, I, I didn't understand that at all. I even asked ChatGPT for help, and it couldn't figure it out either. The closest I came to what you were trying to ask was, was you wanted to set index rebuild thresholds based on low page density. I agree with that. That's how most of the industry does that. But then you threw in something around fill factor that doesn't quite make sense. And the, if you insist on going down that road, route, the way that I think about it is, imagine a table with 100% fill factor, and when will your rebuilds be done? Every time you run your script. And I don't think that's really what you want to have happen. Next up, there's a username that I don't know what it is, and it's got to be a funny joke. A pistol for Patty Garcia says, has the book on availability groups been written yet? I'm becoming an accidental production DBA. Yes, it's called the documentation. <laughs> I don't know why people love reading books written by other people, but they hate reading the documentation. I, wonder, I, I have no idea why that is. The documentation doesn't suck that bad. Have there been any good third-party books written about it since? No, the, the market for third-party technical books is pretty much dead. They lose so much money writing them. They don't make money anymore. So you, if you're used to using books, you should uh, think about alternate ways of getting the information that you need. Um, That's No Moon says, Hey Brent, what's the problem you're trying to solve and how can we help? I am trying to get people to continue to pay me to travel around the world and answer questions in oddball locations while wearing Gucci North Face clothing and being shot with a Leica camera. And y'all are helping me with that? I can't thank you enough. Y'all make my lifestyle possible and I love you for it. 
everyone who watches these, everyone who gets anything from my training, whether it's free, whether it's paid, whether you hire me for consulting, you are the reason that I can continue to do what I do and do what doesn't feel like work at all. And I love you for it. And thank you. That's fantastic. Uh, next up on the philosophical questions, Bamboo Eagle says, what's your opinion of the federal return to office order aimed at the work from home crowd? And will this catch on in the corporate world? Um, the corporate world's already been trying to do it. Uh, lots of companies have already issued return to office uh, mandates. But if you read between the lines, what they're really trying to do is lay people off. They hired too many people during the explosive growth uh, after the pandemic. And they're trying to lay people off without having to actually lay people off. Forcing a return to office is one way to do that because some people will just say, nah, I'd rather not come back. I'll quit and I'll go to work somewhere else. Um, so it's a way to, for them to avoid doing layoffs uh, and not have to fire people. So anytime companies can do that, anytime companies can have less of you expensive meat bags around and not have it cost them anything to do that. They'll generally try to do that. Uh, irretrievable data loss asks a philosophical question. If my failover is manual, do I benefit from enabling database level health detection? Maybe they call it Waterfall of the Gods because people stand here and read questions and they go, why God, why, why? If your failover mode is manual, the hell are you doing detecting any kind of, think about it. Just, just think about it. Just think. You're not getting automatic failover. You're already could be unhealthy all the time. What do you need to detect? Sherlock? Let's see here. Uh, next, uh, we'll go down and look through uh, more uh, philosophical questions. Um, Dopinder asks, will SQL Server Management Studio 21 source control support see wide scale user adoption or will it serve a niche crowd? Um, I think it's not going to catch on widespread uh, because it doesn't do automatic change detection of database objects. What people really want is they want the ability to point something at their SQL server and say, whenever this changes, check the new definition into source control. In a perfect world, they'd love to have like trigger or change data uh, capture integration somehow. They would love to have it so that when someone applied an alter script, that alter would automatically go into along with the person who did it. So you could see whose fault it was that something changed. Management Studio doesn't come anywhere near any of those capabilities. So it's not gonna see widespread adoption. Having said that, I don't think it's bad. I think it's, it's a fine purpose. Not every purpose needs to see widespread uh, use case. It's just that it's not gonna serve the purpose that most people want when they think about putting databases under source control. It's uh, much more utility for DBAs to source control their own scripts. Oh, next one in terms of a really big philosophical question. Uh, uh, Doramu says, why did Azure Data Studio fail and what could have Microsoft done differently? I think that Azure Data Studio failed because it tried to be too many things to too many people. It's a floor wax, it's a dessert topping, it slices, it dices. It tried to do a whole lot of things for a whole lot of people and that's admirable. But Microsoft didn't invest enough developers to make that come true. So they tried to make it be like a management studio for MySQL, for Postgres, for Azure SQL DB, for Cosmos, for SQL Server, everybody. Whether you write reports or develop code, Azure Data Studio is for you. Can it actually do any of those things? Not yet, but we're working on it. So they had such a slow rate of development and tried to be so many things for so many people that it was just destined to fail. You, what you really need to do is you need to have one personality, one, you know, you divide, design your target user, whoever your target user is, you write their biography, what's their name, what do they do for a living, what tools do they work with, 
and you want to build a tool that's perfect for one person before you try to build a tool that's perfect for two people or three people or four different people. And so they, they just spread themselves too thin. That's all it was. Um, do, do I think Microsoft could have done anything differently? They could have picked one specific user and designed a tool around them, but that's not how Microsoft works. Microsoft, and, and most companies, not to be a judge against Microsoft, but most companies try to be everything to everybody right away without trying to start small and build up uh, over time. I, I see them making the same mistake again in the next tool that they're uh, saying that they're going to replace ADS with the, the SQL Server extension for Visual Studio Code. It's for developers. It's for report writers. It's for anyone who needs to work with SQL Server inside of Visual Studio.